Hey guys, uh, this is the um, next episode of the tutorial on uh, game programming, learning game programming in C, and uh, using the SDL2 API to accomplish this. Uh, where I left off last time, I uh, was showing you guys a little bit about the game event loop, or the game loop, and how to process those events, and how to use the keyboard to move a white square around on the screen. I'm just going to show you that. Uh, I've made a couple changes uh, on my own since the last video, namely I made the square a little smaller. I also added a V-Sync option which makes it so the animation is now synced up with the monitor's um, refresh cycle and that will cause tearing not to occur and it'll make the animation just seem much smoother. So I took out the SDL delay but I replaced it by adding this um, V-Sync rendering flag to the create renderer function call. Um, I haven't really gone over this kind of operator. I remember when I was going over operators with you guys, I talked about uh, how I was going to leave the bitwise operators out. Um, the best way you can think about these right now is that if you have flags, which these things are symbolic uh, constants for, and you want to combine the flag options together, you put this single or, not a double or, uh, in front of it. and. Uh, Geez, that just reminded me of another thing I haven't covered. Well, anyway, so that's how we, we create vSync, and uh, those are some of the changes I made. So if you guys were remembering, I was passing arguments into the function for man. So, for example, I said you shouldn't have globals. You should, um, if you want to pass your struct in when you're drawing your, your draw functions, um, if you want to pass, for example, man in, you would pass in in the reference or the pointer to, to the man struct. Well, I've changed that uh, now and I've actually created a more encompassing structure for the entire game. Thinking along the lines of object-oriented programming, I kind of have one game state object and that's going to be the, the root level hierarchical object for everything in the game. So everything that we're going to need to work with the game, all of the game's data and all of its other substructures are going to be a part of this game state. So for example, I put man, the man variable inside the game state and then I'm passing one instance. I create the game state here when main starts and then I, I, I initialize the substructures and then I pass instead of man uh, references to game state to all my important functions like my process events and my render function. And um, it's just going to be a way to keep this game more organized. Uh, let's just assume we were going crazy and we were going to make a full-fledged, you know, uh, platform game. Uh, we would need more than just one struct to, to keep everything organized and that's why I've done this. And uh, I'm going to explain that. Uh, I'm going to expand upon that right now and show you guys the usage of why you might want to to have something like this. So games are cool and everything when you're just drawing squares, but sometimes you just want to draw images. I mean, Obviously, games are based heavily off the of images and sprites. Um, so what I went ahead and did was I drew a quick sprite that we can add to our game. And uh, I just drew this really fast. I drew a star. And uh, kind of reminds me of, like, Mario. Like, he's mad and he's going to hurt you. So um, I went ahead and created some uh, variables to store our star image. First thing I did was I added SDL image to the project. Um, that is important because without SDL image you can't easily load things. For example, this star is a ping file and uh, it'll, it would be very hard to load this without SDL image. So let me go ahead and show you the variables here. Uh, what I did was I added the star texture. Uh, in SDL2, uh, textures are the main type for uh, images. Um, it has to do with the fact that under the hood SDL is using uh, graphics, 3D graphics hardware to draw everything and then 3D graphics hardware images are called textures. So we have our star texture and what I went ahead and did was I added some code to main to load it. Uh, the surface is the actual source image that's going to we're going to use to create our texture. So this is a little confusing. It actually confused me the first time I looked at it. Uh, it used to be a lot simpler in the olden days before hardware acceleration but uh, long story short is you can think of a surface as uh, the source pixels of the image in memory and then you can think of the texture as the hardware accelerated um, 
texture that you use to that, that you render the, the image with. So you only need the surface temporarily once the image is loaded into the surface and then you can use that surface to create a texture. So you can see here I actually declare the surface here in main. I set it equal to the SDL image function called image load which doesn't seem to have any documentation. You pass the name of the file in. Uh, if the pointer to the, uh, the surface is null, if it returns null, it means that we couldn't find star.ping. usually means I didn't name it right or, or type the wrong name or didn't put it in the project properly and uh, it can't be found. Uh, and then that would be a fatal error so I would quit out of the program because without the image the game can't look right. So I'm just going to show you the image here on the project on the, on the left. I added it to the sidebar. And uh, this is going on a tangent a bit, and this has to do with Xcode uh, specifics on Mac. It'll be different on other systems, but I added it to the copy files build phase, um, which copies it right next to the executable so it can be found. Uh, but I digress. So I load the star image, and then after that, I store it in the game state star pointer. Uh, and the way I do that is I create a texture from the surface which takes, I hope this is documentation, it does, good. It, uh, so I, use, I pass the renderer and the star surface and I get back the star texture, remember, which is uh, an SDL texture type in the game state struct. And I got lost. So yeah, I have the, uh, the star surface, or the star texture, and once the star texture has been created, we don't need the surface anymore. So this function will free or give back the memory that the surface is um, was using because we don't need the original source surface anymore. Uh, I went over pointers in the last episode. I'm going to go over dynamic memory, which is the underlying mechanism that um, at least the surface loading and freeing uh, is built upon. So just sit tight if you want to learn more about dynamic memory. I'm going to cover that. Uh, it's kind of an extension of the pointers lesson. So um, we now have the star surface. So as you can see here, I'm passing the game state into process event and do render, so I don't need to do anything else to access that. I will say, though, at the very end of the program, it's important to shut down anything, any resources that the game might be using. So while I got rid of the surface up there, uh, I needed the texture throughout the actual run of the game. Once the game loop quits, the game needs to quit, and therefore I need to destroy or free all textures that have been utilized by the game thus far. So I get rid of the star. As I add more images, there will be more lines here, and there will be more lines up here, and we will actually at some point probably split both of these sections into a load game function and a like shutdown game function. So like I said, you want to keep main as lightweight as possible and keep your code as organized as possible so you don't get confused. So uh, I didn't have to do anything, any changes to uh, process event with the exception of when I move man I now access him via the game uh, the game pointer reference to the uh, game state but um, in the in the render function I actually want to draw the star and the way I do that is there's an SDL function uh, much like SDL render fill rect this one's called SDL render copy and what this one will do is copy or or draw the um, SDL texture that you pass into it uh, onto the, the renderer screen. So this one's pretty decently straightforward. It takes the renderer, the texture, the source rectangle, which is almost always null unless you want to only draw a s smaller piece of the texture, and then the destination rectangle, which is the, uh, the rectangle you want to draw the image in. Um, you can make this rectangle s size to be the same as the image. I you know I have a 64 by 64 image. That'll cause no stretching. If we make it smaller or larger, it will actually scale the image up or down, uh, which is kind of cool. So let me just show you what this looks like. We have a star, which is kind of cool. So now we actually are able to draw images in our game. Uh, let me show you what would happen if I scaled it up by a factor of four. See, now he looks um, more menacing and he's pixelated. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and set him back down to a normal size. Um, this is an important thing to think about. So when you start drawing multiple things in your game, the order that you draw them in is very important. You'll happen to notice here that uh, he's behind uh, the man rectangle is behind the uh, 
the star. The reason why that's true is because first I drew the, uh, the rectangle, and then I drew the star on top of it. If I was to change this order, you would notice now uh, that I would be eclipsing the star, uh, or being drawn in front of the star, based off the order. But I kind of think I want the stars to be on front, because uh, I want them to have more of a presence. So that's kind of the idea of drawing images. Um, I'm going to now combine uh, the concepts of some of the stuff I was talking about with you guys uh, before. Uh, we're going to make another struct. And we're actually going to uh, create object type for the star. And I'm only going to give them an X and a Y uh, right now. And the reason why I don't put the texture in here is because I plan on actually having more than one type, or more than one star, and since the image isn't going to change for them, I don't need to store uh, the star over and over again inside that structure because I have it up here. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to create star, and I'm going to create a hundred of them and put them in an array. And now what I can do is actually utilize a hundred different X and Y positions of the stars and actually draw many of them on the screen at once, which is very, very useful. So let me go ahead and initialize it. So I am going to make a load function because this is getting kind of complex already. So let me go ahead and make void load game. I think you can guess how this is going to work. Pass the game state in because we need that. I pull out our loading code. For now, I'm only going to pull out the um, the initialization stuff. So I'm going to pull out this. I'm going to pull out the loading of the star. Which is useful. I am... I think that will do it, actually. If you ever want to return from main and you're not in main, you can make a uh, call to the system function exit, which will accomplish the same thing for you and terminate the program, uh, which is a little useful tidbit. Uh, I quickly am realizing here that I actually need a pointer to the renderer in the game struct, so I'm just going to go ahead and add that, because it would suck not to be able to have access to the renderer wherever we go. So let me just quickly do that. That will actually defeat the purpose of this second argument here, but we'll go from there. Uh, render. So let me just go ahead and put that. Okay. And then I need a call to our actual load function. Remember, I'm passing a reference in here, so I use the address of. Now I can have room to breathe and initialize the stars. Oh, we have a minute left. So, I create a for loop, and I set each star's position. Based off of some variable. Oh, I don't know. Uh, this isn't going to be very interesting, and I'll show you in a second, but um, that'll at least give us some different positions for the stars. I don't know, something like this. It's going to just create a straight line of them. So I've gone from there. Now instead of just drawing one star, I think you get the idea in our renderer, we use the for loop and we draw many.
The main difference is here we use the star's position. Whoops. And then we have a bunch of stars on the screen instead of just a few. Uh, they're in a straight line, which is not that fun. But uh, let me show you one more trick. I've gone over 15 minutes, so I'm going to end up having to upload this video differently. Um, I'll show you one more standard C library system call, which is srandom. Um, the easiest way you can think of srandom is that it initializes the system for using random numbers, which is a very useful function call. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm going to add one more thing, which might not compile on Windows, but I don't care. Um, yeah, if you don't put time in there and include, oh, I'm going to confuse the crap out of you guys. I'm sorry. Okay, so. What this line does is it initializes the random number generator, but you want the numbers to be different every single time. So you use the time function to give you a different random number seed initializer. And then it's complaining about the return type being two different types of integer types. So I'm casting the return type as if it was an integer so the function doesn't complain. If that doesn't make a lot of sense right now, that's okay. Just remember, this is how you initialize the random number generator. And the reason why I'm doing that is because it then becomes a useful thing for me to initialize the stars with random positions as opposed to, you know, pre-computed ones. So we're going to use random. And we're going to use random numbers between 0 and the width and height of the screen, which I happen to be 640 and 480 in this case. So I'm having trouble explaining how modulo works. Uh, the best way you can think about this code is that it gives you random numbers between 0 and then the number here. So if you want a random number between 0 and 640, you, you use percent %640. And between 0 and 480, you'll use percent %480. And um, modulars are very hard to explain to someone who's never seen them before. But the best way you can think about them is that they cause large numbers to, to become within a certain range. It, ha it has to do with dividing and remainders. And that's all I'm going to say about it right now because the more I try to explain it, the more it gets confusing. So if I go ahead and run this, you'll now see that I have randomly distributed stars around the screen, which is kind of cool. Um, next time, I'll go ahead and explain to you guys some more advanced concepts of games and we might actually start getting into some, some concepts about things like collision detection. Thank you for watching. Bye.